Hello and welcome to Heilman and Haver, the stage and screen podcast, episode 35, coming to you virtually from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios in beautiful Port Orchard, Washington. I'm Matt Haver. And I'm Greg Heilman. We're two local actors looking to hone our craft by exploring the best in local theater and on the big screen. Each week we bring you entertainment news and views, celebrate classic Hollywood, enjoy cocktails with a Tinseltown twist, interview talented local actors and directors, and chat with industry experts from L.A. to the U.K. In a few moments, we'll be rejoined by entertainment writer Susan King. Susan spent 26 years as an entertainment writer for the LA Times and joins us to share some of her favorite interviews with actors like Helen Hayes, Gregory Peck, Sidney Poitier, Jack Lemmon, and Walter Matthau. Susan is passionate about telling the stories of classic Hollywood, so stay tuned for the second half of our interview with this award-winning and entertaining writer. And if you're as big a fan of classic Hollywood as we are and happen to reside in the greater Seattle area, join us for Movies of the Decade at the historic Roxy Theater in Bremerton tomorrow, Saturday, July 3rd, when we'll celebrate the 70s with a showing of Jaws, written by Peter Benchley and Carl Gottlieb, directed by Steven Spielberg and starring Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Dreyfuss. We hit the stage at 6.30 to get the show started, and TCM's Jeremy Arnold will be back virtually with another entertaining and insightful introduction. In the same way Jaws defined a genre, paving the way for multitudes of killer sharks, some of them in tornadoes, and overgrown hungry critters of all kinds, our topic for this week's In the Mix did the same for the science fiction disaster genre. Independence Day debuted 25 years ago on July 3rd, and we're back at the Bay Street Bistro this week celebrating the film's anniversary with trivia and, of course, a new cocktail for you, the Smoked Independence. It's delicious. The Bistro will be open Sunday, July 4th, and we'll be featuring our cocktail, so tune in to our YouTube channel for In the Mix, Independence Day, then make your reservations. Have a safe and happy 4th. And if filmmaking is something that interests you, or you just love independent films, make plans to attend the 2021 West Sound Film Festival, August 6th through 8th, at the Roxy in Bremerton. Submissions are closed, and now the judging begins. For more info, visit westsoundfilmfestival.com, and stay tuned right here for festival news and interviews. And when it comes to interviews, award-winning entertainment writer Susan King is as accomplished as it gets. You've heard some of the big names she's spoken with over the years, many of whom Susan grew up watching on the big screen. She fell in love with movies at the age of three, watching Yankee Doodle Dandy from 1942 on television and Houseboat at the movies with her parents. Susan quickly became obsessed as her parents took her to everything from Pillow Talk to The Parent Trap to The Apartment and Ride the High Country. Susan became a more serious student of cinema at age 17 when she was introduced to such foreign films as Francois Truffaut's Jules and Jim, Jean Cocteau's Beauty and the Beast and Orpheus, and Jean Renoir's Grand Illusion when she watched the PBS series Film Odyssey hosted by Charles Champlin. She earned an M.A. in film history and criticism from USC and then put it to good use at the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, where she worked for a decade, and the Los Angeles Times, where she was an entertainment writer for 26 years, interviewing such legends as Helen Hayes, Hume Cronin, and Jessica Tandy, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Loretta Young, Lena Horne, Gregory Peck, Sidney Poitier, Charlton Heston, Debbie Reynolds, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau, Judi Dench, Sophia Loren, and the list goes on and on. And Susan was awarded the Press Award from the Publicist Guild in 2012 and the Roger Ebert Award for Diversity in Film Journalism by the African American Film Critics Association in 2015. Her archives can be found at latimes.com, and she's currently active as a freelancer for entertainment news website Gold Derby. Susan joins us from her home in Toluca Lake, California. I'd like to spend time with him. I thought it was great. You know, I mean, I go back to when I was four and saw some like it hot. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I was on the set of three of his TV movies. The first one was in 1990. I put it out of my mind because it was so awful. It was an HBO movie where they actually waited almost a year before they put it on HBO. They did reshoots and he was playing an Armenian. Yeah. Uh, casting choice who who, uh, was married to Joanna Gleason and Jonathan Silverman was his son and I think he was having an affair right so I got to see him work and that's when I first heard it's magic time do you guys know about that like every take it's man and I was going wow so I go to his office he sings um sings he had had just come out with a cd of like jazz favorites or something and he was lovely you know and i brought up the show he had done called it's wonderful it's marvelous it's gershwin it was a musical tribute to gershwin with robert guillaume and and fred astaire on nbc and lemon won his first emmy 
for be, basically being Gershwin. And at the end, he kind of has a monologue about everything Gershwin did. And he starts getting misty, you know. And so then a few years later, he was doing Life in the Theater, the David Mamet play. And they were shooting it at the old Mayfair Music Hall. And Matthew Broderick was in it. And again, I got to go twice and watch him perform on the stage with Matthew. And it was absolutely tremendous. And I talked to him again. And then I did a phoner with him. And then in 99, uh, it was around April, March or April 99, twice I drove all the way out to Santa Clarita, which you had mentioned earlier, uh, to a soundstage where Showtime was doing a remake of Inherit the Wind. George C. Scott, that was his last, last thing he ever did. And it was, I think it was Jack's penultimate, I'm not sure, thing he did. And watching the two of them together on doing the courtroom sequence was amazing. I get amazing. And just watching those two together was extraordinary. And then again, I, I got to talk to him in his dressing room. And again, he was really easy to talk to. You didn't think you were actually talking to Jack Lemmon. I felt so bad, you know, when he died. I felt so bad. And the funny thing is, if you go to, to the Westwood Memorial Cemetery, the, his tombstone says, Jack Lemon in. That's great. I thought maybe you would say it's magic time. It's magic time. No, it's, <laughs> but it was, it's amazing, you know, watching. And I was watching um, Criterion Channel is paying tribute to one of my idols, Judy Holiday. So for the first time in years, I watched, you know, PFFFT that he did with Judy. And it was just so much fun. It was just so lovely and fun. I had the best time just sitting there watching because he's tremendous that he could be, you know, he was so funny. And then to me, it all, he was beginning to change with the apartment. And then you had the Days of Wine and Roses, which mm -hmm. I saw that on CBS when I was 11 years old. It was a CBS Friday night movie. And I, it, I, it upset me so much. I've never seen it again. I remember a lot of it. I remember how it ends. Um, I've seen the live version with Piper Laurie and Cliff Robertson, but I've never seen it again because it was so upsetting and dramatic. And I mean, powerful. Was, yeah. yeah. And you know, when you're 11 years old and you're seeing something like this, it was really overpowering. A name that you hear frequently alongside Jack Lemon as a quick aside is, of course, Walter Matthau. Walter. And I grew up on. Grumpy Old Men and Odd Couple 2, and I saw Odd Couple 2 before I ever saw The Odd Couple. Oh, my God. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about uh, Walter? Walter promised me, if I went out to dinner with him, he promised me three orgasms. <laughs> of course he did. I interviewed him. <laughs> Grumpy Old Men was about to come out, but I was interviewing him in Harry Morgan or Henry Morgan. He went. They did these three movies together where he played a Jewish southern attorney like in the 30s and they were the, the incident movies so um i uh it was at the beverly hills tennis club restaurant and he comes in like with a baseball hat on and a t-shirt you know he, he basically comes in a, you know with oscar madison yeah and you know and he was a little you know uh, not quite me too, but he was saying things that I didn't really appreciate. And I said, why are you picking on me? Why are you saying this stuff? And he looked so upset that I was upset. And Morgan said to me, that's how he is. That's, this is how he always talks. So we ended up actually getting along really well. We joked, we had a great time. He was very tall. He was very, very tall. And he said to me, uh, he said to me that um, he had just had a pacemaker put in the month before that he had literally like died and they got the pacemaker in. And so he said, there he was at the 
at this restaurant. I mean, it wasn't a fan, you know, it's not fancy restaurant, but it's the Beverly Hills Tennis Club. And it, like he pulls down his shirt to show me <laughs> most of his chest, including, you know, you could, you know, there was the pacemaker going. And, you know, he, he, you know, hugged me. He was very tall, very big. And I ended up really liking him, you know, underneath this kind of, he probably would have had a hard time talking like that to people, women these days, but he wasn't malicious. This was just sort of like what he would say. There's an element of that generation too, um, I'm sure. Right. But he, you know, he wasn't mean he did say that he had been very loyal to his wife that he was doing some play somewhere and the leading lady showed up at his hotel room and she took off her top and he refused he said no 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 so I mean there was that part of him too you know that he was very loyal to Carol all those years I you know and he's terrific I mean when you look at even, you know, Charade, which I think I've seen 2,000 times, I just, oh. like, Carson, Mrs. Lambert, Carson Dial doesn't have a brother. I just let, you know, or when you look at the work he, you know, his comedic work, or you look at Koch, which is the only film Jack Lemmon directed, or you look at The Sunshine Boys, and one of my favorites too, you know, the, the taking of the Pelham one, two, three. Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. You know, he was, you know, and then he went for a while, you know, he did the laughing policeman. He did Charlie Varick, you know, he did a few, you know, kind of in the seventies, you know, more dramatic roles and, you know, and he was in JFK and stuff. And I, I just thought he was, he was great. And there was this undeniable chemistry that he and Jack Lemmon had that for sure. you can't bottle or anything. And, you know, they died within a year of each other, yeah. literally almost to the day, you know, they died. So I, 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 I'm blessed that I got to talk to them both. I really am. I mean, I, I kind of, when I watch a movie, go talk to them, talk to them, talk to them, met them, seen them, talk to them. Has there ever been anyone who had such um, kind of an aura about them that you were about to interview that made you uh, super nervous? And then maybe when you interviewed them, it was completely different experience than you expected. Maybe they set you at ease or something like that. Well, you know, you do worry about, you know, some really big people. I was nervous about interviewing Lena Horn. I wasn't even, I was under 30 and I was in New York to see plays. And since I had seen her one woman show at the Pantages out here, uh, and of course, knew Lena Horn well, her career. They said, oh, she's available to do an interview because her show's going to be on PBS and she's getting the Kennedy Center honor. So, you know, I, I only had a small uh, luggage case and uh, I was nervous enough, you know, I mean, it was friggin' Lena Horn. And I was nervous enough about that. And then I looked at the really nice corduroy pants I was going to wear and something had happened to them. There was a road, a wardrobe malfunction and I had to wear my blue jeans, but I had a nice sweater on. So I go and it's at one of those couture places because she's being fitted for her gown for the Kennedy Center honor. And I look like the church mouse sitting there with, you know, my little tweed sweater and my little jacket. And she comes out with these big glasses coiffed hair and this apricot colored robe not taffeta but I mean I don't know what it was but I'm sure it was probably worth more than I made in a year you know it's just so she comes while you know glide she glides she glid you know she was gliding out and I said oh Miss Horn I am so sorry I'm so embarrassed that I'm wearing blue jeans I something happened to my nice pants and she said honey, don't worry about it. I'm naked under this. <laughs> but that, you know, I mean, yeah, I you, you get nervous, uh, you know, certain people, you know, or if you hear something, you know, I mean. There must be people with reputations that you right, had probably heard about. Right. Yeah. And, but, you know, like, like I interviewed growing up and still, you know, I adored Sidney Portier growing up and had, had still adored him. And I got a chance to I interviewed him four times in the in the 90s. 
And the first time I interviewed him, he sent me th- four letters, one a month to convince me I should write a book. And he was always glorious to me. But, you know, I was kind of nervous because the thing is, too, it's always hard when you're meeting, you're meeting your childhood mm-hmm. because it's, it's the hardest thing, not even so much your high school years, but when you interview your childhood, these are the people who are formative, the people that you really looked up to as child performers grown up or as, you know, who was a star at Disney or whatever. So here was, you know, I was going to talk to Sidney Portier and I was going, oh my God, I hope he's nice. I hope he's okay. I hope he's great. And he was everything you expected and more. And Gregory Peck was everything I expected and more. The two times I interviewed him, I played the first time we played 1930 movie trivia and the second time we played baseball trivia besides doing the interview. And he was everything, everything I hoped for. And I remember the last thing he ever said to me, he said, you're a really, this was in 1999. He was 83. And he said, you are a very interesting young lady, which was like a fabulous thing for him to say to me. Also that he said I was a young lady. So that (laughs) really, you know, uh, but you do. You, you, I mean, uh, the one person I remember, and it was only going to be a short phoner, but Stephen Sondheim is like God, like the musical theater God to me. And this was in 95. And Passion, which I had seen on Broadway the last time I was in New York, uh, was going to be on PBS. And so uh, the guy who produced it, I know. And he said, I can get you Stephen. And so I was on the phone for like 15 minutes with Stephen Sondheim. And I mean, I was an absolute wreck because it was Stephen Sondheim. I think I did okay. Um, he didn't say, oh, you silly goose or anything like that. So hopefully it was okay. But you, you, know, you do, you just, you know, sometimes you just don't know what you're going to face. You mentioned uh, Lena Horne and Sidney Poitier, uh, both civil rights activists. Right, right. And you you have an award-winning career, including the Roger Ebert Award for Diversity in Film Journalism, which was given to you by the African American Film Critics Association in 2015. Right. How did you focus as a reporter in a way that highlighted diversity and inclusion? Well, you know, I love movies and I love history. I was an American history major in college in Pennsylvania and... You know, I had followed Sidney Poitier since I was 11, seeing his stuff. And, you know, I was, you know, I mean, he was the be all and all, you know, when he was doing Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and to Sir of Love. And, you know, I'm interested in history. And I, I would see these actors, Black actors on television in movies and say, who is that guy? I remember seeing Juana Hernandez for the first time when I was six years old in uh Young Man with a Horn from 1950 with Kirk Douglas. And I was like, who is this guy? I've never seen this guy. This guy is amazing. And I, you know, it's just love of actors and history. And a lot of these men uh, and women were blacklisted. You know, they were, they, you know, if you were friends with Paul Robeson, you were, you know, in trouble. And I would just ask, I'd ask my mother, well, who's Paul Robeson? What's Paul Robeson? Or, you know, you'd see Lifeboat and I go, who's, who's that actor? You know, it's Canada Lee. And I would just start with anything, reading up on, you know, everybody and over the, you know, and, you know, and I would see plays with Black actors and musicals and I would get a chance to interview them, you know, from Hit and Battle and Gregory, I, gosh, I don't remember how many times I interviewed Gregory Hines over the years and, and actresses and actors and, you know, I mean, I remember talking to John Amos on the phone, but it turned out to be a long conversation. You know, I'm from East Orange, New Jersey. And he said, that's where he, del-, you know, and I told him the street I lived on. And he said, I used to deliver papers on that street type of a deal. And, and um, you know, talk to singers. And there's such a rich history of performers and per- performances in the African-American community, as well as you know, the Asian American community, Latinos and, and Native Americans. And I would always, um, I wrote about the, you know, Black film festivals in town. I, I did, a, you know, as much as I could, as often as I could to kind of shine a light on how wonderful these performers are. 
they didn't, you know, and a lot of them never got the chance to really show what they had or very little chance. Uh, and I, I, I've known Ava DuVernay for forever because she was a publicist. And I was the first person to do, you know, a big story on her for her first feature film way back, you know, what was that nine years ago now? It just was a natural extension. It sounds like it. Of uh, my love for movies and actors and history. And boy, and you know, with the African-American performers in history, there's just such a, such a history. You know, you think about what they went through and, you know, like, and you look at that Ma Rainey's Black Bottom or, you know, I mean, just like, you know, they couldn't use the bathrooms and they couldn't do this. And they, I remember I had a really strong phone interview with Harry Belafonte when he was going to get the honorary Oscar. And he told me that he was signed to be the, like the opening act for, I forget who it was. It was a white performer at like the frontier. I think it was the frontier in Las Vegas in the early fifties. And he goes through the front door, you know, which was, you know, you had to go in the back. He went in the front and, you know, everybody's staring and looking at him. And, and uh, they said, you can't, a stay here and you can't be here. You need to only show up and be in the back when you're performing. And he said, well, then I'm gonna, I'm not gonna perform. And, you know, one of the, you know, gangster types came out and said, you know, the only way you're gonna get out of this contract is if you're in a box. And then he called, he called um, somebody who called a relative of theirs like in Cleveland who was Hi, you know, or a friend who was very well connected in the, you know, a tough guy, a tough yeah, guy called a good fellow. <laughs> yeah. So he, he, he was a really good fellow and he called the good fellow in Vegas and he was allowed to stay there. He was allowed to go in the front and it took a while to get the rest of his, the orchestra, his, you know, or trio or whatever, who was with him to also get rooms there. I mean, when you hear stuff like that, you have to have an interest and figure out what's going on, you know, and, and let people know about this. I mean, Lena Horne told me that she tried to get a co-op, you know, in New York, like 51, 52. And she was turned down, not because she was black per se, but because she was friends with Paul Robeson. And she was really good friends with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was like this unsung heroine to, African-Americans in New York, like in the 50s, she was very involved in civil rights. And Harry Belafonte said she was amazing. She goes to, I don't remember, you know, Eleanor and says, Eleanor, I can't get this co-op because of Paul. And she said, oh, really? And a couple of days later, she got the co-op. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, I don't remember that much about my interview. You know, I can't like quote everything, Ellen, you know, Lena Horn said to me, but that, that stuck out. Yeah, for sure. And besides that, she's saying she was naked. You know, I mean, yeah. so, <laughs> I was like, oh, well, at least I'm not naked, you know. Well, Susan, it sure has been fun uh, talking to you. I do have one last question, and that's yeah. kind of self serving in a way. Um, so, for people who are starting to get into or, or interested in getting into journalism or writing or two aging podcast hosts that are looking to cover <laughs> Hollywood. So you guys are great. Uh, what sort of advice would you give? You know, I was I talked to a class oh, about a month ago. They laughed at all my jokes, which was good. But um, I don't know what type of advice to give because the landscape is changing so much. If you go through J school and, you know, get your master's, it still may be hard to get a job, you know, or you may get work, but you may not get paid that much. And a lot of it may just be like, how much can you turn out, you know, because in the world of the internet and blogging, it's kind of how much you blog. And also how many people, how many eyes do you get? And like, if you belong to something where people subscribe, how many subscribers, how many subscribers did you get? In a way, it, that doesn't seem like journalism to me because, you know, it's a headline and like an opening paragraph. And then 
just to get people's attention, then you can write. But if you don't get their attention and they don't click or they only click for a certain time and maybe they don't subscribe, they read it and go, I don't want to subscribe to this. That's kind of like a lot of what is, you know, people base success on these days. And that's kind of hard. You know, how many social media, how, what's your, what's your social media? How many do you have? Following. Yeah. Uh, you know, and if you have X, oh, that's not enough. We're not going to hire you because we want at least 5,000 on Facebook and 10,000 on Twitter and 5,000 on Instagram or something. Then to me, I, that's not journalism. No, and it's not, and it's, it's kind of a superficial way of uh, judging someone versus you with your experience and your ability to research, ability to talk to people and get information from people that others wouldn't normally get. There's value in that. And, and when you're looking yeah. at clicks and likes and shares and things like that, that stuff gets kind of lost. Right. It, it, it gets, you know, when you work really hard, but if it's something that 25 year olds don't want to read you can't write about that again or something from it you know similar to that from what I was told my classic Hollywood stuff did relatively well with clicks and and follows and stuff but you know you just never know I think it would be hard and you know things change you know especially with the pandemic offices are closed a lot of the papers are you know people you know their buyouts you know the trib Chicago Trib, their buyouts, you know, because that one company bought all of the Tribune papers and, um, you know, it's, it's rough out there. I think hopefully things will change or maybe things will get better. So if you're in high school and you want to be a, a journalist, maybe by the time you get out of college, things will have changed. This has been an education. You really? Was I okay, guys? Oh, oh more than <clears throat> we've learned. A and you know, we're going to have to have you back. Oh, okay. That's Absolutely. Great. The people that you've met and the stories you can tell are just phenomenal. And, you know, I think there is a kind of a turning in a way, like you said, your classic Hollywood stuff gets plenty of attention because I think there's a, a turning kind of attention back towards that golden era, those classic days of Hollywood. People are yearning for that. Uh, you know, TCM is still a popular channel for that reason. You know, we get a lot of great response when we talk to people about classic Hollywood, when our guests are focused on that. People like Jeremy Arnold, uh, right. who you know. Yes, Cornell, and, uh, as I call him. Right. He looks right. like Cornell. <laughs> to me, he looks like a young Cornell Wilde. <laughs> well, and that's that's part of the reason that we do this is is to is to bring people on who have that depth of knowledge and have these careers, uh, you know, where you've experienced these things and met these people, because that is really priceless. Oh, well, thank you, guys. I'm glad I didn't disappoint. Not by any means. Nope. We've, we've had a great time. And also, how many people, how many eyes do you get? And like, if you belong to something where people subscribe, how many subscribers, how many subscribers did you get? In a way, it, that doesn't seem like journalism to me. Because, you know, it's a headline and like an opening paragraph. And then just to get people's attention then you can write. But if you don't get their attention and they don't click or they only click for a certain time and maybe they don't subscribe, they read it and go, I don't want to subscribe to this. That's kind of like a lot of what is, you know, people base success on these days. And that's kind of hard. You know, how many social media, how, what's your, what's your social media? How many do you have? Following. Yeah. Uh... You know, and if you have X, oh, that's not enough. We're not going to hire you because we want at least 5,000 on Facebook and 10,000 on Twitter and 5,000 on Instagram or something. Then to me, I, that's not journalism. No, and it's not. And it's, it's kind of a superficial way of uh, judging someone versus you with your experience and your Ability to research, ability to talk to people and get information from people that others wouldn't normally get. There's value in that. And, and when you're looking right. at clicks and likes and shares and things like that, that stuff gets kind of lost. Right. It, it, it gets, you know, when you work really hard, but if it's something that 25 year olds don't want to read, you can't write about that again or something from, you know, similar to that. 
from what I was told, my classic Hollywood stuff did relatively well with clicks and, and follows and stuff. But, you know, you just never know. I think it would be hard. And, you know, things change, you know, especially with the pandemic. Offices are closed. A lot of the papers are, you know, people, you know, their buyouts, you know, the Trib, Chicago Trib, their buyouts, you know, because that one company bought all of the Tribune papers and, um, you know, it's, it's rough out there. I think hopefully things will change or maybe things will get better. So if you're in high school and you want to be a, a journalist, maybe by the time you get out of college, things will have changed. This has been an education. You really? Was I okay, guys? Oh, oh more than. <clears throat> we've learned a lot. And you know, we're going to have to have you back. Oh, okay. A- absolutely. The people that you've met and the stories you can tell are just phenomenal and you know, I think there is a kind of a turning in a way, like you said, your classic Hollywood stuff gets plenty of attention because I think there's a, a turning kind of attention back towards that golden era, those classic days of Hollywood. People are yearning for that. Uh, you know, TCM is still a popular channel for that reason. You know, we get a lot of great response when we talk to people about classic Hollywood when our guests are focused on that. People like Jeremy Arnold, uh, right. who you know. Yes, Cornell, and, uh, as I call him. Right. He looks right. like Cornell. To me, he looks like a young Cornell Wilde. <laughs> well, and that's that's part of the reason that we do this is is to is to bring people on who have that depth of knowledge and have these careers, uh, you know, where you've experienced these things and met these people, because that is really priceless. Oh, it, well, thank you, guys. I'm glad I didn't disappoint. Not by any means. Nope. We've we've had a great time. Well, thank you again to our guest, Susan King. You can find her archives at latimes.com and her latest work on entertainment news website, goldderby.com. Join us next week when we'll welcome Tim Hagen to the show. Tim is the founder of the Olympic College Film School and chair of the digital filmmaking department where he teaches acting, directing, and film studies. And if you enjoy the show, make sure to follow us and share the podcast with a friend or two. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Amazon Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Pandora. And we'd love to hear from you, so please join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. And as always, thanks for supporting local theater and for joining us here on Heilman & Haber.